and China find a way to continue its rapprochement with the West? How can connectivity with European Union can be improved in this context? All these questions which have animated our international debate over the last you know, six months, you know, we are in fact hosting this meeting after the IMF meeting in October, G20 meeting two weeks ago, and uh, COP27, we try to understand the world of multiple crises, the world of poly crises, as Adam Tooze mentioned, in which we are living today. So this is, you know, the stage, this is the context of our conference, and I'm glad that uh, my colleagues and co-host uh, Annie Wapol is here also today, and I give him the floor also, followed by Massimo De Andreis, also our uh, partner, and last but not least, Mr. Salta Bayef from the Institute for World Economic and Politics and the Astana Club. Any, please. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Paris, also from my side, uh, on behalf of the Center for European Policy Network. And uh, I would like to thank, uh, of course, first of all, Mark, for his incredible job of bringing up this uh, great uh, agenda for today and tomorrow. I would like to also to thank uh, all the speakers for having accepted our invitation to come to Paris, and of course the sponsors for supporting this event. As Mark said, this is the fifth um, uh, edition of the Dialogue of Continents. We started in Hamburg in 2017. We're in Paris, and now we are back to Paris. That's, that's great. And um, well, uh, as you said, Mark, we we are living in critical times of, of the transition to, to a future that probably will, will look very different to the, to the past and to the, to the present. So we have seen the last three years uh, many black swans and there are so many big elephants in the room. And uh, so this is a, uh, an age of multiple crises or as Adam Tooze has said, a pulley crisis. So it's a great time to discuss all the important topics uh, in, the, in these tr 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 critical times of uh, transition to a new future. And so thank you very much again for, for coming, for joining us today and tomorrow. And I would like to hand over to Massimo. Thank you, thank you, Anning. Also from my side, uh, SRM is an economic research center part of Intesa San Paolo Banking Group, Intesa San Paolo probably you know is the leading Italian bank among the top uh, European banks. We have uh, 11 subsidiary banks uh, abroad and 54 branches all over the world. And we act for the bank as a fin tank to try to analyze the world economy and the trends, and especially for what is happening in the Italian economy, but we also cover all about maritime economy uh, energy, so key sector for the world economy. Just think about that 80% of the world trade is by uh, maritime mode, I mean by ship. So checking the maritime economy is a way to understand connectivity, which is uh, one of the key issues that we will discuss uh, today together with other very important. So today and tomorrow it's a great opportunity to address the major issues facing the world economy. Uh, we see, for example, one, uh, I would say, important trend in the world economy, again, checking from the maritime perspective, maritime economy perspective, which is the regionalization of the globalization, the shortening of supply chain, uh, a sort of near shoring or friendly shoring process. Uh, we see also uh, what is happening from another angle perspective, which is the energy sector, not only for the Ukrainian war. There is the, uh, the great process, uh, which is uh, especially at the European level, uh, the decarbonization process, which is quite in impacting uh, the, the, the energy sector and the evolution, also from the economic point of view, also from crisis and industry point of view. So uh, our Europe is facing the crisis, which is one of the key issues we will discuss today. We decided together with my uh, friends uh, to, to put a strong uh, uh, point of the two days on, on Europe, because I think that crises are also opportunity to grow. And for Europe, I think that uh, to grow means to be more united. So it's a great challenge. Um, well, let me conclude just to, to join all the thanks that Henning 
already uh, had to you as uh, attending this conference, to the, to the sponsors and to my uh, friends and colleagues. We, we are together here because we, we have a long partnership, but a special thanks to Mark Uzan because uh, it's up to him if we are all here together today a great uh, program and high-level people around the table. Let me just then to remember that last year we were in Naples because we have a long-time partnership. So last year we were in Naples. Unfortunately, last year we were in the middle uh, between the end of pandemic and an unknown <laughs> future. So we were half of this uh, number of people today, or a third perhaps, I mean, not too many people in presence, but uh, just to, to say that uh, it's, uh, uh, we were in, three years ago, if I remember well, uh, in, in Hamburg, uh, then in, in Paris again. So, I mean, it's a, a continuing story, and I hope next year another city in Europe to uh, stay again on the key issues of the world economy. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, uh, the participants and guests of this uh, Dialogue of Continent, the fifth edition. Uh, my name is Jorgen Saltbev. I'm the director of the Institute of World Economics and Politics uh, from Astana. Uh, today, we're witnessing the end of the year of abundance. Emmanuel Macron just recently warned about this. And the world is entering a new era, era of uncertainty and instability. Uh, concrete steps and actions are needed uh, from international community to address multiple crises from threats of economic recession to outbreak of maybe nuclear war. So our common goal today is an honest exchange of opinions, and I hope that we will succeed today given such uh, a representative composition of our participants. These are well-known experts on finance, economics, <coughs> geopolitics, security. Uh, it was possible to assemble such a unique composition thanks to the cooperation of a number of partners, uh, including the Senate Club. And for the opportunity to gather in Paris, I want to especially thank uh, Mark and uh, the whole team uh, working together. So among our guests is uh, outstanding world economist, Mr. Nuri Rubini, who is uh, at the invitation of Astana Club, was able to join the discussion. Tonight there will be a, a fireside chat with his participation. Uh, maybe you know about that. And the signing ceremony of the book uh, that he recently published, Mega Threats, uh, 10 uh, Mega Threats uh, in the World. So I'm also glad to see the participants um, of these meetings from uh, Astana Club Astana Club previous years, our friends, uh, Mr. Jacob Frankel, uh, Mark Zen, Leza Curtis, and many others. So during the two days, important topics ranging from the economic agenda to nuclear and climate agenda will be discussed. In particular, the session of, on Greater Eurasia will focus on relations between European and Central Asia. Uh, these relations have an, undergone a significant transformation, I should say, since the beginning of this year. And I would like to highlight just uh, two points confirming the new dynamics between our um, uh, Central Asia and uh, European Union. Firstly, it is symbolic that our event is taking place during the official visit of the President uh, of Kazakhstan, Mr. Kassim Jamal Tokayev, to France. Uh, since the beginning of the year, uh, we have been observing the rapprochement of the EU and Kazakhstan. Uh, for eight months of 2022, the trade turnover increases more than 40%. And secondly, in short period of time, uh, the EU High Representative has recently made uh, a couple of visits to Kazakhstan on October 26, uh, the President of the European Council, Mr. Charles Michel, arrived in Kazakhstan on an official visit to participate in the uh, European Union Central Asia Summit. On November 17, the High Representatives for Foreign Affairs and Security, Mr. Joseph Borrell, met with President Tokayev in Astana, uh, during which he made the important statement um, uh, that the EU would compensate third countries for damages from sanctions imposed on Russia. This is a significant moment for both sides, since today the losses for Kazakhstan um, export by very conservative estimates, I should say, according to some estimates of Ministry of Industry and Infrastructural Development of Kazakhstan, up to 300 million in 2022. Um, and some estimates are much, much higher. And the agreement reached may open new up opportunities uh, for cooperation between our uh, sites. So, dear friends, uh, the results of forums such as ours um, are sure to be reported to decision-making centers. I hope that our discussions and suggestions um, that, will, made, uh, that will, will be made will help our governments and politicians to solve existing problems, find compromises, and perhaps even resolve uh, military conflicts. I sincerely hope uh, for an interesting and fruitful discussion today over the next two days. So welcome to our forum. Thank you.
Thank you, Yazen. Thank you very much. So why don't I call our first uh, group of speakers and panelists, particularly central bank governors, but also former central bank governors, and take this opportunity to thank also Jacob and the Jacob Frankel Zuckerman Institute for, for the support, his partnership and his friendship also to work closely with us for putting this conference. So let me call on all of you. Thank you for coming to Paris. It's a great honor, and I'm very pleased that uh, Mr. Borowski, Didier, uh, the head of global macro research at Amund Institute, will be sharing the session. Please, over to you. Thank you very much. So thank you, thank you, Mark, for inviting me, and thanks to uh, the speakers, uh, former or acting central banks, very well known, and it will be very interesting to share views about the uh, global macrofinancial landscape and uh, the inflationary trends that we are seeing these days and the new challenges that uh, we will face. Just as an introduction, I just want to say that, uh, as you all know, we are uh, uh, some of the major trends that have characterized, in fact, the global economy of the past decades have shifted. Basically, uh, uh, we are seeing uh, 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 more and more unpredictable shocks and events. And as you all have in, uh, in mind of what has gone over the past uh, three years that have, that have completely changed, in fact, the global macrofinancial outlook, uh, the COVID crisis, uh, uh, supply uh, chains uh, problems. And in addition to that, at the, at the end of the COVID crisis, uh, we had this uh, uh, war in Ukraine that, has, since the start of the year, has completely changed uh, uh, the macro, uh, the macro financial, uh, financial outlook. But in addition to that, and I think it's a, a, a topic that we will uh, debate, we have also uh, uh, moved from an environment, and it's not only about these two unpredictable shocks, an environment with very low interest rates and inflation to uh, an environment where uh, inflation and interest rates are moving higher and put uh, uh, additional constraints on uh, policymakers. Uh, uh, all that in an environment where potential growth is trending lower at a global level as a result of aging populations, uh, 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 of low productivity gains over the past decade, and fixed in investment also at, uh, at the global level has proved to be uh, very, uh, very disappointing despite very accommodative monetary condition before uh, these, two, uh, these two big shocks. So that's a, a, new, a new environment, and I would say that uh, we have, uh, at the same time, uh, the great what I would call the great globalization that has ended. Uh, the fact is that uh, we live in a multipolar world, and uh, we see that uh, the, these, these crises, these shocks, in fact, uh, uh, um, uh, generate an upward pressure uh, on, uh, on inflation. Corporations are looking for more resilient production processes. And at the end of the day, it's all about the near shoring, the French shoring, that will have a, an inflationary component looking ahead. So it has become a, 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 big, a big challenge. It's what, what, what some uh, economists call the P factor, the geopolitical factor also, that is very important with all these shocks. And uh, we, have also, we are also seeing the, great, uh, the end of what I would call the great coincidence because at the start of the, uh, 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 of the, uh, uh, Ukraine, uh, the, the COVID crisis, we had both fiscal and monetary policies that were going in the same direction. It was 
to see to, uh, quite easy, I would say, from a poli uh, for policymakers to act, and you had this uh, large asset purchase program that supported massive uh, uh, budgetary plans, but this whatever it takes approach has ended now. We uh, governments and the British crisis has, uh, has shown that uh, the whatever it takes approach uh, can no longer work. There is an additional pressure coming from markets, from interest rates. So where do we stand? That will be a, a, a key point also to address. And finally, my final point, and the big elephant in the room, is the climate transition in this environment. Uh, uh, this uh, this uh, challenge was already there before the two big shocks that we have experienced over the past two years. But it has now become a, a key concern how to channel savings, private savings, to, uh, 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 to this uh, 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 and to finance, in fact, the energy transition and the change of the economic models, not only in advanced economies, but also uh, in emerging markets. So I will stop there and start uh, uh, with uh, uh, questions to our distinguished panelists. And the first question would be uh, 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 to, uh, uh, to you, uh, Mr. Frankel. Uh, we live in an environment where we see that inflation is back, and there is a hot debate between economists about the origin of inflation. Inflation was back before the, the, the Ukrainian crisis. So what, what can we say about the inflationary process and, uh, uh, and the, the global environment in which we are uh, living? Thank you. Thank you very much. Since I'm the first uh, speaker, I want to... Uh, save the time of my colleagues and thank very much to uh, this great organization. I think that when there is a, a child and that has so many people who would like to be his parents or her parents, it means it's a successful child. And if you look at the number of sponsors and partners, you realize how many from all over the world want to embrace this child. But in order not to be confused, I want to also to make sure that I repeat what was said already. Uh, this child, while it has many uh, parents, has one primary parent without whom this would not have happened, and this is Mark Uzan, and Mark, uh, uh, all the glory to you. Uh, the second point is that you were talking about transition, and indeed, you know, each time in fact, during the past, since the Second World War, every meeting could have started by saying we are now in a transition period. And, and the reason is that the world is changing. There was once a very famous uh, economist, philosopher in uh, the University of Chicago, and then he went to Princeton, who once said that uh, a transition period is the period between two transition periods. Uh, so in a way, if there is one lesson in all of that, is that S1 designs a system or a structure that is capable of addressing the, quote, problems of the day, and the days are changing every day, uh, that structure should be sufficiently malleable, sufficiently flexible. Otherwise, you will end up always having the machinery that belongs to the different uh, era. But the important thing about people, in contrast with structures, is that people must have memory. And memory means one of the functions of this organization is to let's learn not only from each other, but also from those who are not with us, namely from the history. And we are, history repeats itself, believe it or not, in terms of principles. But you ask me now about uh, inflation and the origin and how come. And I want to take you uh, just one year back. And uh, the governors that are sitting at this table will testify. Uh, just a year ago, if we spoke about inflation, we would have been uh, chased out of the room as being obsolete. After all, inflation is like smallpox, we were told. It has been eradicated. And therefore, what are you worried about? If we have a problem, it's a problem of uh, deep uh, secular stagnation, deflation, implosion, lack of growth. And in fact, we central bankers, and I say we because uh, uh, Mark, my only correction to you, you said there are here current and former central bankers. You know there is a dictum 
which says once a central banker, always a central banker. So there are no formals. This was a self-serving remark, needless to say. Uh, the point is that uh, inflation was always there, except that people and policymakers and the press, and I must say central banks, uh, did not look at the right place. They were looking under the lamp post, and the lamp post for inflation was defined as the consumer price index, and they said the consumer price index does not uh, go up, and in fact, they even developed a theory starting from the introduction of China to the world of uh, there is an infinite supply of cheap uh, labor and cheap products, so inflation will not be restored, and the CPI will not show it, except for one thing. Inflation was there, the money did not go to the moon, but it went to the asset market. It went to the asset markets because uh, that's where people go when interest rates are zero. What else would you expect? And that's basically, inflation was there, inflating real estate, inflating stock markets, inflating this and that, and many other distortions. But it's not because of the lack of inflation. In fact, we did not look at the right place. And that's very important, because that's the reason why people were surprised. And I must say they were surprised, and uh, not that there were not enough people who uh, alerted the central banking community that uh, this is not sustainable and all the rest. And in fact, uh, a small sample of those who made this uh, advance warning are sitting around this table, which is not a random choice, I should say. But the fact is that indeed, this is the situation. Three years ago, at the IMF meetings, the mission of the discussion, I say three years ago because this was the last in-person meeting and, uh, due to COVID, the idea was we have to come back to maybe normalization because interest rates have been too low for too long and we will need to discuss it and all the rest. And then suddenly came COVID and with COVID afterwards came uh, Russia, came Ukraine, came uh, North Korea, came uh, food crisis, came energy crisis and all the problems that were there two, three years ago are still with us, except with ad great additions. And then I asked myself, how come in a meeting of that type, th five central bank governors, current and former, are sitting around this table? None of these issues can be addressed by monetary policy. None of these issues were created by monetary policy. And yet it is so natural that let's ask what the central banks can do for us. And the reason is, frankly, because we took it for granted that all the other policy instruments are paralyzed because we are all, we understand the politics, we realize that they are paralyzed, there are difficulties, issues, and suddenly we take the political echelon, and I'm sorry to say that, off the hook because the responsibility is there. And then came the notion of central banks being the only game in town, and some central banks actually saw this as a compliment rather than as a dangerous syndrome, because the fact is that when you are taking upon yourself objectives that you don't, do not have the tools to analyze them, first of all, you will not deliver, second, you will be held responsible, third, your institution will be prejudiced, and then your independence and the very important elements in central banking is going to be in danger. So I'm starting the, my remarks by saying, why were we, why, was, why, why were things wrong? That's one of the reasons. But I want to give you a little bit of a deeper issue. For many years, for many good reasons, since the European crisis and then uh, onwards and onwards, interest rates were pushed to zero for good reason and no tools for monetary policy. If there are no tools for monetary policy, central bankers decided to do whatever they can do. And instead of dealing with the interest rates, which was already close to zero, if not negative, they invented QE, quantitative easing. And quantitative easing was understood as well, if you don't change the price, you can change the quantity and you will reach the same thing. Except that, of course, you distort the entire 
uh, financial system. And the uh, gentleman to my left, who is now in charge of the financial stability of the central banking community, uh, will be able to tell you how vulnerable we are if you distort the pricing of risks and if you distort the awareness of where do you deal with the financial sector and if you have dominating uh, players in a market and especially if the players are governments and central banks. So it is in this regard that the situation was that you went to a war with tools that were not the best to deal with the challenge. And then interest rates were going to zero and the question was the zero lower bound. How can you do policy? And the argument was, well, don't worry, we can print more, we can do more QE, we will supply the liquidity that is needed. Financial vulnerability arose as a result. And the next step was, in such a case, when should we exit from a non-sustainable area? I say when should we exit because all of us, as we are driving along highways, you would never enter a highway without knowing if there is an exit on the other side. But central bankers refused, and I say refused as a strategy to discuss the exit. And the reason was that if we discuss the exit, so the argument went, people will misinterpret it as we are about to exit. And we are not about to exit, and they will be frustrated. So that's not discussing. And I think this is, again, an important issue because the issue of transparency and looking at the exit and knowing that there is one is an essential part of it. And then the argument was, trust us. And the reason why you should trust us because we are data dependent. Data dependent is when we see the data that tells us that there is, for example, inflation, then we will act, of course. But implication of it is, when we do not see the data, we will not yet act. Therefore, you build into, by the strategy, being behind the curve. Because you will not move until you see it. And but once you see it, it's too late. It is a fundamental departure from what used to be the foundations of central banking up to the crisis that we were talking about. Up to the crisis that we were talking about, and some of you remember the names of William McChesney Martin. He was the legendary chairman of the Federal Reserve, 17 years, much before Volcker. He said something very important. The task of a central banker is to remove the punch bowl away before the party gets going. Think about it. It's a very tough role. You invite people for a party, and when they want to drink, you go to the punch bowl, you take it away. And then you explain to them that you take it away because it will be bad for you. And they ask you, will it be bad for me? Why? And you tell them, because I know it's bad for you. I've been there before. I saw it before. I'm a professional. I have credibility. And this is the key. And if I don't have credibility, I cannot tell you this remark. Which means data dependence is not to be understood as you look for the data to tell me what to do. You look for the data to analyze what is the expected outcome, and then you act before the expectations are realized. And if, if, I, may, if I may, just to, to share views, and, and regarding, for instance, we, we are now in the middle of a, an episode in Europe that is the stagflationary episode, and I'd like to get your own views, uh, Mr. Knott, about you know, the multiple shocks and the fact that we have higher inflation at the same time, a recession that is coming in Europe, uh, or probably in certain countries, how do you see the reaction function from central bankers and, uh, and the macro-financial risk that we are facing these days in, uh, in Europe? Well, thank you also, uh, uh, and thanks, Mark, for inviting me to come over here to Paris uh, on this issue. Well, Jacob, I think, already gave a very nice uh, exposition on where the inflation uh, was coming, coming from. I think for a long time eh, we came out of a situation where inflation, whatever we did, eh, whichever rain dance we performed to get inflation going, it was stuck at 1% uh, underlying and it didn't seem to move for a while. But all of a sudden it has returned and it has now returned with a vengeance. 
uh, uh, if you look, uh, well, two weeks ago, for the first time in history, actually, Eurostat reported a double-digit inflation number for the euro area, 10.6%. Of course, the story is well known, a lot of energy and food uh, components into it. But what I think is more worrisome from a policy perspective is the underlying trends, and particularly if you look at core inflation, excluding all these food, alcohol, tobacco, energy, the volatile items, core inflation is picking up, let's say, 0.2% almost every month, and it increased to f no less than 5% already in, uh, in October, an all-time high there as well. Now, in our projections, we do assume that inflation will come back uh, close to, to values close to 2%, uh, let's say in the course of 2024, but it's also fair to say that the risks uh, to that projection are entirely tilted uh, to the upside. There is, of course, the uncertainty about the war in Ukraine and whether that will provide new shocks to the energy provision on which we in Europe are much more sens sensitive than, for instance, in the US. There is fiscal policy, which actually, uh, to the extent that sort of the fiscal support measures are not merely targeted to those that really need it. And the European Commission last week came out with an estimate that roughly 30% of the measures is targeted, but 70%, unfortunately, is untargeted. Well, that constitutes a fiscal impulse, a fiscal impulse at a time in which we have a significant above target inflation. So that's an upward risk, I would say, to our in inflation uh, projection. And then, of course, there is the issue of potential second round effects, basically, through the wages. If you look at the most recent sort of wage deals, they're clearly not in line uh, with sort of having a 1% productivity growth plus a 2% uh, inflation uh, target. That's well understandable. I mean, uh, the euro area has sort of been confronted with a terms of trade loss of roughly 5%. That terms of trade loss needs to be allocated among workers, among firms, among the government, and you cannot expect that allocation to be a one, uh, a one shot game. Uh, there will be some efforts to sort of pass it on to uh, each other and then to pass it back. And so it takes a while before uh, that has come uh, to a, a new equilibrium uh, in and of itself. But that means that we will have uh, uh, risks to the upside as far as the uh, inflation trajectory is, uh, is concerned. Now, on growth, there is absolutely news about weaker growth. 0.8% uh, Q and Q in, in the second quarter declined to 0.2%, plus 0.2% in Q3. Q4 will be weak. I think all the data is there to confirm uh, that Q4 will be weak, so we might enter actually into negative growth territory in Q4. Whether we will have a recession or not, that of course depends on how long uh, this weakness will persist. There is actually some relaxation recently on uh, the bad news to growth. For instance, if you look at Germany, where actually the economy is doing better uh, than, uh, than was feared. So it's not a foregone conclusion that we will get a, a, a recession. We will get weaker growth, that's for sure. But we also need weaker growth to bring inflation back to target. I mean, to bring inflation back to target, we will need a protracted period of time at w in which at least growth is below potential. Uh, because otherwise we will never get the disinflation uh, going. The base effects will make sure that in the course of 23, the energy uh, component will clearly come down quite strongly. But as I said, the concern is core inflation. And uh, we started tightening our policies in December uh, 21. If you take the normal 18 to 24 months lag, that means uh, that you will not begin to see the impact of that on core inflation until only the second half of next year. Um, and then, of course, you need a very strong disinflationary process to bring you back to target uh, the year uh, thereafter. So that's another way of saying uh, that the risks here are clearly uh, tilted uh, to, uh, to the upside uh, when it comes to, uh, when it comes to uh, inflation. Now, two more points. We will have to be strong on inflation as the sentiment. Regardless where the inflation is coming from, I, I entirely agree with you uh, that the, the causes of these, uh, uh, this inflation largely lies outside the realm of, of central banks. We nonetheless have to deal with the consequences because that is what our mandate uh, prescribes to us. 
There is a debate about negative supply shocks, whether they should look through or not. Well, first point I'd want to make is that in Europe, it's not only about negative supply shocks. There's clearly also a very strong demand effect. There has been a strong demand effect from a stronger than anticipated reopening after the COVID uh, lockdowns. There is also a strong positive association with, between forecast errors in inflation and in output. The broadening of the inflation that I talked about uh, to also traditional goods and services shows uh, that there is clearly a gap there between demand and supply. And with our policy, we have to make sure that we bring back demand, that we realign, let's say, demand with the strongly reduced uh, supply of, uh, of goods and services as the consequence of the shocks that we've been, uh, we've been living through. So let me stop here, uh, okay. my way of introduction, and okay. then I, I can you, be more Antonin, specific. Thank you, Mr. Vedrick. I'd like to on. know what is, uh, on your side, your view on the, we are navigating in stagflationary waters. Uh, fiscal policies have reacted strongly so far with uh, very different, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, policy interventions. How do you see the stagflationary environment uh, in Europe and uh, uh, these days? <coughs> Thanks uh, for the question, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, Mark and the others. It's always a pleasure to be here. I was in Hamburg on the first, I think, uh, uh, event five years uh, ago. So good to be back again. Uh, on the on the stock uh, on the risks and basically the, the developments. I, I I broadly agree with what Klaas has said. Um, we have uh, two different developments now. I would say Europe being in a, in a worse situation than the U.S. Uh, we might get into the recession in Europe, but uh, from what we see now, it's, if we get there, it's going to be a mild. We might be already in a recession, but it seems that it will be mild recession, relatively short-lived, nothing compared to the 70s when the GDP dropped by eight percentage points as a, a response to the, to the first oil shock. And the inflation rate is lower than it used to be then. Uh, however, uh, we do expect it to come down uh, in 2023-24. I also agree that the risks are uh, on the uh, upside that we will have actually higher inflation, and this is probably the, the uh, biggest risk that we see apart from the geopolitical risks and the, and the worsening of the geopolitical situation. Um, what we see now is that the supply chains are improving, uh, that the commodity prices are coming down, transport prices are coming down, and uh, I think because of that, we can be relatively optimistic that we will not get into a, into a serious inflationary uh, problems like we had uh, in, the, in the past. Um, if you look at the, at the risks, I would say uh, mm, we might have uh, a risk of, I would say, a combination of the multiple risks. One is that the inflation rate stays higher for longer than we expect, so that it gets entrenched and then we don't really see it coming back down to 2% as the uh, forecast models uh, uh, show and forecast models always show that it will come back to 2% uh, and they are obviously uh, wrong for many years uh, now. Uh, if it stays higher uh, and uh, growth pro prospects uh, become weaker, so we have a, not, not a deep recession, but basically lowering of the potential rate of growth, uh, then we might see uh, more of the asset and collateral price corrections in the, in the markets later on. So we might get markets becoming more optimistic in the short run, but then in the medium to longer run, if uh, the, these two risks materialize, we might see uh, further corrections of the, of the uh, asset and collateral prices in the market, and that can lead to the, to the uh, systemic, I would say, financial risk, and then class could tell more about it, as uh, Jacob has uh, uh, suggested uh, earlier. Uh, again, Europe being in a worse situation than the US, US might actually escape the, the uh, recession altogether. China depends a lot on the zero COVID policies and how the COVID situation will uh, and now uh, develop over the, over the winter. But in Europe, uh, although we will not see most likely uh, restrictions on the energy use, which were the main risk 
Uh, if we talked about the situation a month and a half ago, obviously the biggest risk was that we will have to uh, have restrictions in Europe. Now it does not seem to be a uh, uh, baseline scenario, uh, except if we don't have a very, very harsh winter, which, uh, which we don't see coming. But the energy prices, again, I, I would say that the risks are medium to longer run again, uh, rather than, than, than short run. Now, the energy prices are likely to stay high for a prolonged period of time, uh, which will then have a, a, a negative consequences for the, for the potential growth in, in Europe. Uh, depending on how things develop, whether the Russian gas will uh, be completely out of the picture, or we get back to Russian gas to some extent, maybe 20%, 25 30%. And when I talk to different people, I get different uh, uh, views on whether ever Europe will get back to the Russian gas. Some say never. Some say as soon as the sanctions are lifted. Uh, I, I would guess that uh, it's really political question. It's not a, if, if you let the, if I ask the entrepreneurs, people from the industry, they would get back immediately if the sanctions are lifted. Uh, but as long as the sanctions are there, it will not, uh, it will not happen. So it, it's really a political question, difficult for us as economists to, to predict, but that can lead to, uh, in a medium to longer run, if it persists, to the reallocation of the industry, uh, if there is no technological solution. I'm typically technology optimist, but uh, in, in this case, uh, I'm not sure whether technology uh, improvements will be fast enough to prevent the, the, the um, reallocation of the, of the industry. So, thank you, thank you. And so to, to sum up, if I want to, just want to understand, uh, risks are skewed to the downside on real GDP growth, at least in the short run, and even possibly on potential growth, and risks are still tilted to the upside on inflation in the short run, but there is a great deal of confidence that at some point, by 2024, core inflation will decelerate. Do you agree with this, uh, Mr. Galston, with these broad views that, in fact, at the end of the day, that's not, we are not back to the 70s, it's a, it's a short-term phenomenon, and that at the end of the day, inflation will be under control and, uh, and growth uh, uh, will be maintained. Okay. First of all, again, I'd like to thank Mark and the organizers. And it's extremely humbling to sit on this panel. Uh, let me start by, by telling you probably a bit of another story about the emerging market part. So usually when people talked... Uh, after 70s or 80s about emerging markets or developing countries, the policy making was done probably in an inferior way there, right? So the assumption was that developed world has developed so toolkit that is ready to fight inflation or to bring the growth back and developing world is not there yet because there is no ammunition there. To my understanding, 1990s and 2000s led us to learn our own lessons very firmly. And that's why the challenges that we're facing now are tackled in a more systemic way by a developing world because um, things that were taken as granted for the developed world as the credibility of the central banking and so on were not taken as lightly from the developing part of the world. So that's the major difference uh, with this shock compared to the shocks of 1990s and 2000s for the developing part of the world because we clearly understood and did our homework to prepare ourselves for this new wave of extreme difficulties coming. It doesn't necessarily mean that we are fully ready for non-linearities and, and uncertainties, but I think we are very well equipped to deal with the things now compared to the not even further past. So regarding my assessment of, of the things, and I'll give you the, the example of, of the Central Bank of Armenia, probably we were one of the first central banks in the world, if not the first, which started the tightening cycle, and we did it in 2020. So uh, when Fed was contemplating with an idea, is it transitory or not, we increased the interest rates by one percentage points in 2020 when our inflation was well below the target because we were anticipating that there will be a pent-up demand, there will be some supply 
disruptions and so on, which will eventually lead to unprecedented level of levels of inflation. And that's why, as Jacob said, we were not data dependent, but we were looking probably far ahead. And then um, we reached the peak of the inflation in 2021, in November, when the rest of the world was still having very high inflation. Our inflation started coming down. And then in February, we almost were at the target, but unfortunately the war in Ukraine started. And then here we go again, and then there is another round of roller coaster. So um, saying all that, my, my main point is that uh, developing world or the emerging markets have learned their lessons from 1990s and 2000s, and they are much better equipped to deal with this type of crisis now than before. Second point I would like to make is that <clears throat> currently at the bank we're moving to a new framework of dealing with the monetary policy. Our past framework was called F Pass Mark 1, which stands for Forecasting and Policy Analysis System, developed by, by friends from the IMF. And recently we published a paper with Doug Luxton and David Archer from BIS telling about F Pass Mark 2 approach. So in F Pass Mark 2 approach, we're trying to implement systemic approach to what uh, Chairman Greenspan called in 2004 risk management approach to inflation or monetary policy. So we're trying to bring this risk management approach to more systematic framework where we are not debating around one baseline scenario, but we're trying to bring multiple scenarios at the same time and trying to communicate with the public all possible scenarios and trying to tell them the one story. And probably going back to your question, whether it's possible that this is the most predictable thing that we'll see, uh, lower GDP growth and higher inflation, probably yes, but according to our approach, we shouldn't tell only that story, but we should tell general public and the markets also the different stories and the most importantly, what are the tools that will bring inflation back to the target? Very interesting. So the fact is that uh, uh, emerging, emerging markets, emerging economies have started the normalization process in terms of, of monetary policy on average much earlier than uh, uh, advanced, uh, advanced economies. Where do you see, it brings me to a, another question in this uh, very challenging macro, uh, macroeconomic environment, where do you see the biggest financial risks? Uh, uh, in Europe, but also at a global level. So I'll start with you, uh, uh, Mr. Knut, regarding Europe. Yeah, well, the biggest risk, I think, is, uh, uh, is coming from a vulnerability that the FSB has been monitoring and asking attention for for a very, very long time. And that's, of course, the high level of indebtedness that you see everywhere in our economies. It's logical that there is a lot of indebtedness because interest rates were low for a very long period of time. <laughs> and so if you incent people to borrow, then <laughs> don't be surprised that at some point they will borrow. <laughs> and in some countries, uh, there's too much household borrowing, probably in my country as being an example. In other countries, it's probably more about corporate debt, maybe in this country. Um, in yet other countries, uh, it is about, of course, public debt, uh, which uh, has been elevated for a very long period of time and does not show any signs of, uh, of coming down yet. Well, it's very clear uh, that now that financing costs are on the rise, uh, it simply means uh, that uh, balance sheets will have to adjust. And that uh, uh, these parties that sort of have taken on uh, these high amounts of leverage, they will have to prepare for a future, which uh, in my view will hold uh, higher interest rates, not only temporarily, but I do think for a much longer period of time that many, many people are at this moment willing to, uh, to accept. Well, if I translate that to the public finances, for instance, it simply means that primary fiscal positions will have to adjust to this new reality of higher, uh, higher interest rates. Fortunately, a lot of borrowing has been done at a relatively long maturity, so it means that the new reality will bite only gradually, and it means there is adjustment time the same, by the way, is true for household debt in the Netherlands. Eh? Most mortgage takers in the Netherlands have also sort of financed their mortgage at a fixed interest rate of 15, 16 years on average. So it means there is time to adjust. 
but the adjustment will have to take place, and we know uh, that these adjustments do not always take place in a smooth and uninterrupted uh, fashion. Secondly, uh, we have sort of in the more market-based finance sphere, we already have had a couple of incidences of liquidity mismatches, mm -hmm. liquidity mismatches that came to the fore uh, in March 2020, the so-called dash for cash. Then we had the issue with Archegos, a family offers. Earlier this year, uh, we had the issue with commodity traders and their derivative uh, positions. Recently, we had an issue with British pension funds and their LDI-driven uh, investment strategies. And these are all examples of sort of severe liquidity mismatches po combined with pockets of hidden leverage, leverage that is not immediately visible. And I think we will get, we will, in the coming years, we will see more of these types of uh, disruptions as central banks are gradually withdrawing liquidity, huh? raising rates during QT uh, already in the US, but also I think next year in the Euro area. Um, then of course, uh, there will, liquidity will be scarcer, there will be less excess liquidity, and then liquidity mismatches in open-ended funds, in money market funds, etc. they will come to the fore, and that will create tensions uh, every, every now and then. Now we are trying to step up our work on this so-called NBFI, eh, non-bank financial intermediation, to make sure eh, that we have more liquidity management tools available at the fund level to deal with uh, such uh, periods of recurrent uh, stress. But there is clearly quite some way to go eh, before uh, these risks will be uh, entirely under control. And then a third risk, but Martin can probably talk a little bit better about that, is of course emerging markets mm -hmm. and their foreign debt and their foreign currency debt with a, a relatively strong US dollar. Uh, that has been a vulnerability that has been out there for a while and that is also showing some of the weaknesses now in the emerging market world. Uh, an increasing number of countries is coming to the IMF and to the World Bank and they will have a, a busy time uh, ahead of them. And just turning uh, to, to emerging economies, uh, what is your take on the financial vulnerability of emerging markets with the strength of the US dollar and higher interest rates? Yeah, so uh, thank you. So first of all, I, I would like to tell you that there are probably two or more stories for the emerging market world. Currently, we're talking with the Astana Club and then Kazakhstan and Central Asia. I think Caucasus and Central Asia are a completely different story. And the given, given that the conflict in Ukraine affected this part of the world probably positively rather than negatively in economic terms, because all of those countries have uh, positive growth rates, and they have an influx of capital to the countries, and that helps somehow to, to distinguish with the rest of the world. Now, compared to the other part of the world where the central banks should increase the interest rates to match up with Fed, because the, they need to, to preserve their flight to quality in excess, and then uh, I think there might be a problem with uh, the countries that are excessively uh, burdened with, with the debt. But at the same time, um, I see that even though there are several countries which are highly indebted and they need to increase the interest rates for their, their national currencies, the homework that they have been doing for, for the rest of 2000s and 2010s would help them to mitigate that crisis probably a bit with less vulnerabilities than it happened before. Uh, saying that, I, um, and there, there is also an, an interesting issue with the Fed increasing the rates, and then uh, from one perspective you can think that it's very negative for the developing world because when Fed increases the rates then you need to step up and increase your rates even more because there are no linearities there. But at the same time, um, feeling that Fed is very adamant on its mandate to bring inflation back, back to the target gives us hope that the credible monetary policy by the Fed could also help our own credibility. Okay, so not that worried regarding uh, the Not, not at this point. Not I mean, point. yeah, we're, we're looking it to it very carefully, but there are some pockets of vulnerabilities, let's say in China and somewhere else, um, but I think in general, we're much, much more prepared than we did like 10 or 20 years before. 
So ju just a, a question also to Mr. Wilczek. Uh, Croatia will join the Eurozone uh, at the start of next year. And in this very challenging environment, mm -hmm. how do you see the situation? And uh, is it a challenge or an opportunity for Croatia in this, uh, in this environment? Well, I think it's, uh, it's definitely an opportunity rather than... I mean, it's, it's always a challenge to some extent because we're, we're getting into a, into a club which has its own problems, which we will have to participate in, in, in dealing with. But uh, it solves out much of our own problems uh, in the first place. If you compare Croatia, for example, during this crisis with the other Central East European, EU, non-Euro countries like Poland, the Czech Republic, Hungary, Romania, etc., uh, you'd see that uh, this time around, exactly because we are already on the path to the Euro, markets have already priced in now the Croatia joining the Eurozone, so interest rates in Croatia did not have to increase nearly as much as they did in, in for example, Hungary, Poland, Czech Republic. Uh, the inflation rate is lower. There is no pressure in the foreign exchange market. While there was a pressure in the foreign exchange market of all these countries and the central banks had to intervene. Uh, so you see the beneficial effects already of the, of the past to the, to the, to the Eurozone. Um, and, um, I'm sure that you know, once we join, uh, they will further materialize, uh, although I would say uh, probably 85% is already priced in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the market prices. Uh, I think it also shows that the Eurozone participation uh, for a small open economy like Croatia is particularly beneficial at the times of the crisis. You know, when the things are good, everybody's doing well. So it doesn't make so much difference whether you're in or out. But uh, when the storm starts, uh, uh, it's much bigger. It's much better to be in a bigger tent with lots of people uh, where it's warm, uh, where it doesn't rain. It's not that uh, uh, stormy as outside. Uh, and we experienced these things, for example, in, during the great financial crisis, when we were not a part of the eurozone. Uh, I mean, the, the impact on on in financial markets was much more severe. And then uh, when the COVID started, uh, there was such a shorting of, of Croatian currency in the markets. Uh, we went in, in six weeks time uh, to, to a point where even at some point banks started to hedge their equity positions uh, because of the panic in the, in the markets at that time. This time around, nothing. It's like a smooth smooth sails through the, through the crisis. So you, it's good that you're joining now the, the, the Eurozone. It would be better if we were there during the last two crises, but uh, during the COVID crisis, we got a nice uh, help from, from our friends in Frankfurt. Well, the moment that the swap arrangement was established between Croatian National Bank and the ECB, you know, the moment that it was published on the Bloomberg, you saw the immediate appreciation of the Croatian currency and then stabilization, and nothing happened after after that. So, so again, for a small open economy, joining the Eurozone makes all the sense, <laughs> particularly during the crisis. So, so good to know. And so now I'd like to turn to a, another topic, which is deglobalization and fragmentation. Uh, there is all these debates about, you know, the new globalization, will it prove inflationary? And uh, do we, we are living de facto in a more fragmented world. So I, I'd like to get your views. Uh, Jacob Frankel on the on the impact on the global economy on the, on the, the U.S. dollar and the, on the global financial vulnerabilities in this environment. Thank you. Let me try to bridge between the discussion that was just uh, that we just had and the new uh, topic. Uh, I think that uh, uh, Boris emphasized the benefits from a bill, uh, being able to have central bank communication and uh, exchange of views and preventing fires before they break out. And that's a very important thing because normally what the public sees, including the politicians, are the actions that are taking place to extinguish a fire. They do not see the actions that are taking place to prevent the fire. And those actions do not make the headlines, but they are on going, and I think that's something that the public does not know so much. And the second point, during a long period where interest rates were so low for so long, CFOs or chief financial officers of companies and corporations all over the world 
were building their plans and financial plans on the assumptions that interest rates are low and they will stay low. It is, this is the reason that as we go into normalization, a lot of balance sheets of a lot of companies are going to be adversely impacted. It does not mean that we does not need to go to normalization, but it means that the communication with the markets are now much more important so that people know that the storm is coming, and more importantly, that there is no insurance, pre insurance policies without charging insurance premium. Namely, governments must be strong enough to allow zombies to get out of the system in order to allow the better co corporations and financial institutions to survive and stay in the system. And I think that's a very important uh, issue. You cannot save everyone because if you try to save everyone, you save no one. So that's the real one important thing that is the legacy of a period in which there were excesses. It's not the cost of correcting the distortion. It is the manifestation of the cost of what has happened during the distortion. Now coming back to, to your question. Uh, we see deglobalization in the sense that uh, nationalistic movements in many places are confused with the notion of us versus them, let's have a wall because uh, we are so different and windows only bring storms from outside that never bring you the smell of roses from the garden, we should close the windows and all of this kind of thing. Uh, fragmentation does not mean lack of interdependence. It only means that the interdependence is much more complex and that we do not have the machinery to deal with the extraordinary interaction and the cross effects and the cross shocks that are still there. So I think that the notion of French shoring and all of those kind of things, let's separate between the good and the guys and all of that, this sounds like a moralistic approach, but I think it is bad economics. It is bad economics because the whole principle of economics is try to maximize the domain over which people are allowed to express their comparative advantage and not say, these are my friends, with them I do business, these are not my friends, with them I do not do business. Because the fact is that the way to become friends is through doing the business, through making sure that everyone understands that we are all in the same, uh, in the same boat, so to speak, and as a result, uh, communication is not a privilege, it's an obligation. And it's, a, it's a really the responsibility of governments and public sector to ensure that the lines of communication are open and this is why you are elected. Not, and the, the notion of saying us versus them brought us a lot of disasters in the past. So protectionism is not the solution, as I understand. So just come back now on the big elephant in the room, which is the climate transition and how to finance the tr climate transition because there are physical risks, there are uh, financial risks. So I know that you have a time constraint, kind of, so I will give you the floor now. So how do you see this debate in Europe and at the global level? Well, first of all, uh, I want to start by saying that I couldn't agree more with what Jacob said about this deglobalization. And uh, Jacob didn't sort of uh, think it through all the way to inflation. But if you believe that globalization was one of the factors that kept inflation low for so long, then inevitably I think deglobalization will also mean a structurally yes. higher inflation. And the second reason why I believe that we will not go back to the low inflation trap uh, that we were in before these two big shocks, <coughs> Corona oh, and sorry. Ukraine hit us, the second reason is actually to do with the greening of yes. the economy. Uh, that is another factor. I mean, we have to undergo a massive energy transition. And we know that when an economy needs to undergo transitions, that there is always a temporary effect also on inflation. Now, this transition might be quite long lasting. It will be a transition that will keep us uh, uh, busy, keep policymakers busy, not only for years, but possibly for, uh, for decades. And that is a second reason why I also think uh, that structurally 
we will have a higher inflation and we will not move back to the inflation rate that we had before, uh, be before, before Corona. It needs a lot of public investment. Yes. It needs better pricing. Yeah? I mean, every it's economist... Hard to finance. Hard to finance. Ha well, the pricing in and of itself will, of course, generate revenues, right? Oh. If you have appropriate carbon pricing, nitrogen pricing, and what have you, um, yeah, that could also generate revenues um, to, to, make, to make these investments. But these are, I think, in the short run, they will definitely also lead to, uh, to higher pricing and, and, and therefore higher inflation. And that assumes that we are already in the new equilibrium, right? But we still, <laughs> before we're there, we still have to disinflate from the current, what is it, 10.6% to sort of whatever the new equilibrium inflation rate will be in this new uh, equilibrium. And also for that, I think, as central bankers, we will need a lot of tenacity um, Europe is not known for its flexibility of labor and goods markets, etc. That means that, of course, eh, then disinflation will also be a more painful and worn out process probably than, for instance, in the US. Now, the US may have to come from a higher peak, uh, but what goes up fast can also come down uh, fast. And in Europe, I think we have to yeah, prepare ourselves for a, uh, a protracted period in which policymakers like us, central bankers, will have to be on it and, uh, and just focus on restoring price stability. Okay, thank you for these remarks. And turning to emerging markets, uh, the last uh, global financial stability report from the IMF shown that uh, there are massive needs in order to finance the adaptation of these economies. In particular, it is estimated that by 2030, $1 trillion per year will be needed. And for the poorest countries, $300 billion. How would you see, uh, Martin, this, this, uh, this, uh, this challenge, how to channel money, in fact, uh, to, these, uh, to these countries. And I know also that uh, President Macron called for a, a meeting in Paris in June, in June 2023 to create a, a new financial pact in order to help the poorest countries. What is your take on these, uh, on these developments? <clears throat> um, I think that one, one thing is obvious, that uh, though there is a need for this amount that you mentioned, like $1 trillion dollars per, per year, that is the IMF estimate, but at the same time, we all understand that central banks or emerging markets couldn't see idle, sit idle and wait till the developed world helps them, them to, to mitigate this type of things. So in that sense, I think um, it is a very dif difficult and peculiar situation because from one hand, because of the inflation current that we're having, we're calling for a fiscal restraint from our governments. But at the same time, we understand that there should be a need for excessive spending on greening the economy or that type of things. And for that, I think there are uh, several instruments which are pretty new to the market, but let's say this debt to environment swap or debt for the climate swaps that um, you agree with your donors that, that you spend an extra dollar given from the donor community to the greening of the economy. And that somehow contributes to lessening of your uh, debt debt ratio to your GDP. So that type of instruments would work, but I think uh, national governments should take it seriously mm. as their probably number one priority in their list. Uh, that is not very popular from the political standpoint because now you're uh, talking to constituency which is having problems with the gas price and the oil price and all these things. But I think uh, governments should step in first international community should help as a second pillar, and then the private will, will come on, on the board, if the pricing goes rightly. Okay. And uh, Mr. Vujic, how do you see this, uh, this debate about you know, the, the, the financing of the energy transition in Europe and at the global level? Oh, I think uh, that uh, the real answer to that, I'm, central banks got into the uh, uh, area because we were called in in a way, but I, I think that the pricing of the the uh, is is the key thing, and uh, it's up to the governments really to uh, to do most in that respect. Uh, I don't think that the central we are part of it. We are doing what we can. I'm chair of the Vienna Initiative. We're now setting up a large uh, uh, workshop uh, with uh, three subgroups with the banks to see first how to 
basically get a common questionnaire that will be sent to all the clients, because now every bank is sending their own questionnaire, uh, to see what's the exposure to the, to the uh, climate risks of, of different uh, uh, clients, and to see what's the color of the portfolio of the, of the banks. And this is kind of a first step, I think, in order to understand where we are in that uh, area. And then we can think of uh, further policies, but again, I think it's, uh, it's up to the governments, really, to do most in that respect, uh, which is not easy. Uh, we've seen that uh, it, it backfired uh, uh, um, when the first governments made a bold move, and then they, they went back, uh, but it, this is the only way to go, I think which will be efficient in the end. Thank you. I understand that this climate transition will prove uh, inflationary. And it's a question for all. Aren't you worried that in this environment where we have higher inflation ev almost everywhere, central banks could overreact at a global level? Aren't we, are you worried that, in fact, you could see a negative feedback loop of an excessive tightening of monetary policies? And at the end of the day, given the level of debt at a global level, that could derail I would say, uh, the, global, uh, the, global, uh, the global economy. So that's a question for you, Jacob. <laughs> <laughs> a difficult question. Well, uh, as I was listening to the last five minutes, I said to myself, we are talking about inflation and the dangers thereof. We are talking about climate and the dangers thereof, and uh, etc. And then I said, what's the relationship between all of those? And now your last question really brings up that question, which is the following. Why do we have, to begin with, problems of, why are we afraid of reducing inflation? What is the reason? The reason is that the economies are not sufficiently flexible so that when we take the measures that reduce monetary expansion or things of that type, it is not just transforming itself straight into prices and that's it, but it goes through the real economy because of rigidities, etc. This is the reason. And why do we have rigidities to begin with? Everyone understands it. Because the governments have not taken measures that we in the jargon call it structural policies. Structural policies are those policies that remove distortions from the economy, increase the flexibility of the economic system, difficult to implement, and those who implement will not be around to benefit from the outcomes because they take a long time to, to flourish, and that's why politicians do not implement it. And now I connect it to the climate. If there is something that is really never, never land, even though it comes now already, is climate policy. Why was it neglected so long? Because it will be in the next generation. So when you connect it all together and you ask what's the political systems that create difficulties in, in, in implementing structural policies, in reducing the cost of stabilization as thereby, it is the same challenges that reduce the difficulties in dealing with the long-term uh, climate issue. So the issue is how do we create in our democracies, elected democracies in most places, incentives for the political system to think about the next generation where the voters are there that were not yet born. Very difficult to create such a system. And we will probably never have a smooth ride, but from time to time there will be reminders of conferences or like this one saying, don't be sanguine, think about tomorrow, and then you go back to business for the daily affairs. So, thanks. Yeah. Yes, yes, please. No, on this risk of over-tightening, I mean, let us not forget that in, with respect to ECB policies, we are still in the process of merely removing yes, accommodation, that's right. That's right. removing stimulus, right? So to then already talk about the risks of overtime <laughs> no, is a bit of a joke. No, uh, but my, my question at a global level, <laughs> yeah. the level of you know, the, fi the tightening of financial conditions, taking into account emerging economies last year and advanced economies, is unseen since the 1970s. So, it's a so big once we go global. into a restrictive territory, then yes. you're then sort of you're allowed to talk about risks of overtightening. However, as long as the risks to our sort of inflation outlook are so clearly tilted to the upside, I think the risk of us doing too little is clearly more pronounced than us doing too much. 
But the more we do, and the farther we go into restrictive territory, then of course the risk becomes more balanced, and then the risk you're talking about uh, should also enter into our uh, deliberations. But for the moment, I think it is too early. For the moment, I only regard it as helpful that sort of the whole world, uh, monetary policy in the entire world is synchronized, because it means that tightening outside the euro area also helps us achieve our mandate uh, by bringing inflation back to 2% over the, over the medium term. But it's absolutely premature, in my view, in this still relatively early stage of tightening to already talk about over-tightening. And given the level of global debt, it's also a question for all. Are you worried that uh, the normalization of monetary policy is not only in Europe, but at a global level could derail, uh, I would say, uh, uh, the economies of, such, uh, of some vulnerable economies? Well, <clears throat> if, you, if you think of the uh, debt service costs in GDP, uh, now they are much lower than they used to be during the Eurozone debt crisis. Okay. Mm. Uh, so as Klaas has said before, because of the long period of very low interest rates, uh, that has created the space for the adjustment without uh, creating immediate problems for, uh, for any of these countries, uh, as their situation is much more comfortable than it used to be 10 years ago. Uh, but that means you know, that you have to act now. Like fiscal policy should always try to create a fiscal space uh, at a time when it can in order to be able to use it in the tough times. If you don't create a fiscal space when you can, then you're going to have problems uh, when you don't need to have a problems when it's better to have a fiscal, fiscal space. And that, uh, that is a lesson that you know, uh, everybody should, uh, should have already learned, but it's, it's, it's difficult sometimes uh, to, to get the governments uh, act uh, upon that lesson. The same thing uh, works for the structural reforms. No? I've been told uh, I've, uh, for 25 years that you know that structural reforms take time to you know, yield results. But you know if they were done 25 years ago, by now they would have yielded a lot of results. Okay. And if you continue repeating, you know that you know this is not a solution because it's only it will only yield the results in a, in the medium run. Then you're never going to do it, and uh, you will. Five years later, as Jacob and me have said at many panels, uh, you know, five, five years from now, we will sit here and say, well, look, structural policies, they, they yield results in medium run. So this is not the solution. Let's see what we can do now. So just to, to, to end this panel, I just want to ask you a quick question. Please answer just in some words. What keeps you awake at night? What is the biggest macro financial risk that you have in mind for the coming two years? So starting with you, Jacob, just right to the point. In <laughs> Why don't you go the other way around? Okay, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jacob is worse, you see. <laughs> That's no, the experience in the... In I'm the always government. polite. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, uh, what is my usually uh, 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 worry is not the macro. Uh, financial risk is, is that we have some kind of a cyber attack in the central bank or something like that. This is, this is something like you, you wake up and then there is something terribly wrong going on okay. and you don't know what to do about it in a, in a, in a second. Uh, and that's, that's usually what, what, what worries me that that might happen. I don't see uh, immediate uh, macro financial risks apart from you know, having a simultaneous appearance of, as I said before, higher inflation for longer, lower potential growth for longer, which I think is likely scenario for many reasons that have been uh, said around the table, including the deglobalization, I would say the, in the first place, the deglobalization, because the history tells us whenever we had a deglobalization, we had a lower productivity, a lower potential growth, and we had a higher inflation. So and if you are in, in such a period, yes, then in the end, you might also have that spilling over into the financial sector risks with the uh, with the correction of the of the further correction of the of the price so close you know that you have a time constraint what is well your... very briefly i mean i'm not yet so worried about growth also because the labor market it has not been mentioned in this panel but the labor market yeah, in the euro area is functioning much much better than in earlier episodes and if we get a sort of limited slowdown of the economy i expect a lot of labor hoarding which means uh, that, uh, because labor is structurally scarce. 
So that, uh, that's why I don't think that unemployment will go up so much. So my worry is still inflation, 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 and the fear that we give up too early on the disinflation. The, the current disinflation that is in our projections would be historically unprecedented. Look at the historic episodes of what it takes to, to take inflation back from double-digit numbers to 2%. Uh, to 2%. I mean, we should not give up too early and not cry victory too early. That is my main concern uh, that we would. The message is quite clear, Martin. No, I just would like to add a couple of words to what Klaas said. I'm a strong believer in our mandate, and we should do whatever it takes to bring the inflation back. There is a lot of noise around in a developing world, developed world, governments, international organizations will talk about pivot, and then there is a difficulty to explain to the people what does the pivot mean, whether it's going back from zero to zero 0.75, whatever. So we're in a completely new environment where R is greater than G. And then if we don't want to punish our societies in a most brutal way, then we need to take our mandate very seriously. So, so I'm going to, the, the, all of the governors were, of course, focusing on things that are within their fields, whether it is the finance or inflation or whatever. But I'm not sure it, one, it keeps you up at night. But if I go to, to the night and I ask myself, what's unique about the, this current period? In this current period, in so many areas in life, in politics, in economics, in medicine, in everywhere else, we are in a risk management approach. We do not know the distributions, we do not know outcomes, but we have to make decisions. How do you make decisions under this type of uncertainty? You do what you were learning from day one in school. You recognize that you, will, you are bound to make mistakes and you compare the cost of mistakes. We call it type one error versus type two error. Do you do something when you should not have done it? Or don't you do something when you should have done it? And how do you make those choices? Mm -hmm. By assessing the relative cost. This is nice in theory. But there are areas where the cost of a mistake is not correctable. And those areas have to do with the nuclear, with the uh, things of that type, where there are more existentialistic issues. And I think that uh, since uh, the beginning of the Cold War, Second World War, we have never had a period during which, during which uh, the geopolitical stresses in the system in so many areas, whether it is in the Chinese syndrome, whether it is the Russian syndrome, whether it is the North Korean syndrome, in all of them the world nuclear or the Iranian syndrome, everywhere the world nuclear comes up. And we do not know the outcome, but we, there are mistakes that cannot be correctable. And that's the kind of thing that uh, we have to ask. In this situation, should you bias your decisions into not the symmetry between type one, type two errors, but really to reduce and maybe eliminate the probability of an error that once it happens, it is uh, catastrophic. Okay, they are you. not in the inflation front. Okay, thank you for the last words. <laughs> thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you. Okay, just 10.20. 10.20. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very good, very good. Thank you very much. Uh,